question of governance. But I think I get your major point, and that is beyond this kind of, uh, let's say, democratic argument, there is a greater argument of certain fundamental norms, fundamental human, uh, let's say, values that should be subscribed to around the world if there has to be any kind of, uh, any, any kind of authority which states can command internationally. I agree with you that these are actually there and these are now increasingly, uh, in a sense, insisted upon. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is there. There are, uh, there are uh, sort of concern, I mean, uh, norms for the prevention of genocide. There are certain, uh, the, the, the entire structure of the human rights uh, institutions in Geneva actually now build up towards uh, a kind of common acceptance among member states of certain moral standards. And increasingly, the world of the NGOs and civil society around the world have become more and more powerful in driving home to all states, uh, irrespective of where they are located, on the need to address certain fundamental uh, moral norms, address certain norms in the conduct of policy and in the treatment of their population. That is not to suggest that you know uh, you that everybody else can decide that you know how corrupt a particular leadership is. I think there are certain thresholds, and it is necessary for the world to insist on these thresholds to be observed. Because I think all said and done, it is still the 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 world is still run on the principle of sovereign equality of states. May so I, I think. May I come in on that because I would like to add a supplementary. You see, the assumption is that there, are, there is something called democracy which exists. That's not true. Democracy is an ideal. Nobody has achieved democracy. Some are closer to democracy, others are further from democracy. And please note that some of the countries that are called democracies are not democracies at all. They are republics, which means that the people come in only once in four years to express their opinion. In fact, other countries are more democratic than even the United States. In Switzerland, for example, you cannot change the color of the parking meters without a national referendum. <laughs> and so people <laughs> determine everything in some countries. In the United States, you have it once in four years or once in two years. That's republic. It's not a democracy. One. Number two, in all democracies, and Ambassador Nambiar brought up this point, Aristocracy is built into the democracy. You have the aristocracy of families. Families, dynasties come in because a family name ensures that the next leader will be part of the same family. That's aristocracy. It's not democracy. You have the aristocracy of money. Depending on how much money you have, you can get elected. Now that's not democracy, that's aristocracy. You have the aristocracy of the corporations who play a predominant role in the best of democracies. That's not democracy. That is the rule by the aristocracy of the, the corporations. And so democracy is a nuanced yeah. term. And uh, one, should be, one should be chary of dividing the world simply into democracies and dictatorships. As I said, democracy is an ideal. We are all trying to work towards it. Some of us are higher on the rungs of the ladder, others are lower. And you must recognize that Aristotle talked of democracy as a bad form of government, <laughs> not as a good form. In fact, polity for him was a good form of, of the popular government. And what you called aristocracy, I have called oligarchy. Aristotle called oligarchy the bad form of the rule by the few. In that sense, I think it is true that ultimately, even in democracies, it is a small group of people who ultimately decide. Now, I, to get to the second point regarding the veto. Now, this is connected again with the whole question of the oligarchy. Ultimately, if you are to live in a perfect world, of course, you will find that uh, it will be discussed. It, there will be a, a, a kind of a consensus decisions taken on most issues. But on issues of war and peace, on issues of conflict, on issues of varying interests between states, particularly in this uh, world of ours, I don't think you're going to get that kind of perfect solutions. And if 
you are to and unfortunately for the uh, in, as it has turned out it is only by assuring that some decisions that is major decisions uh, relating to uh, fundamental uh, questions of national interest you just have to get the big boys uh, on the same page unless you do that it's not possible for you to be able to uh, get uh, you know move forward and that is true even whether you when you go into a G20 people talk about G20 decisions ultimately if in the G20 formulation or in the G20 forum you are to have a difference of opinion between the United States and China today you're not going to get very far I mean that's the truth of the matter and ultimately uh, you may, uh, you, this is the, the actual fact and while it is true that the veto does exist, again in today's world, uh, given the pressure of the media, the pressure of public opinion and the sheer pressure of perception, I think there are limitations even to the exercise of the veto. To, to take just this latest view of the discussions which are taking place uh, uh, on uh, issues uh, relating to uh, to the Middle East and things like that, you are finding even countries which would have been using a veto have actually now discussed, decided to you know, to let to discuss matters relating to uh, to all kinds of uh, issues on the Security Council without having to resort to the veto. Yes, but uh, the question is a bit more than the veto. The question is about the Charter and we have to acknowledge that the Charter is hopelessly out of date. You have an Article 23 in the Charter which describes the names of the permanent members and one of those permanent members it says is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Now you that's, know and I know thing, yeah. that there is no such country. But that's what the Charter says. You have a whole chapter in the Charter about something called the Trusteeship Council which does not, which, ex, which is a miracle body because it exists and does not exist at the same time because there is no transition. You have an article 23, uh, 53 which describes Germany and Japan and Italy as enemy states. How is it possible? Between the three of them they are contributing more than one third of the budget of the UN. How dare you call them enemy states? And so how is it that this charter cannot be amended. What prevents the amendment of the Charter? That is the question. Well, the prevention of the amendment of the Charter, if you start amending one aspect of the Charter, you're going to find they will, they will have to update the Charter in many other areas. And I think that does not meet up with some of the national interests of the current uh, permanent members. And I think that is the ultimate uh, problem. And if you are to, if you are to update today, you have an EU which is a common uh, uh, a common foreign policy. Your people talk about increasingly. There is a talk about the EU being given a a position in the United Nations more than that of an observer organization, because it speaks on behalf of the countries of the uh, the 27 countries of the European Union, and yet. You have two individual members who are permanent members. I mean, you have to change the situation. Updating the, uh, the, uh, the organization will require a, re a revision of the charter, an amendment of the charter. But uh, I think there, there is fear that once you start moving, updating some of these elements, there will be a strong pressure to amend other aspects of the charter, including perhaps the, uh, the, 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 the numbers of permanent members. And perhaps permanent membership, permanent in membership itself, itself yes. Uh, yes. Will be questioned. Yes. Let's move to Bronx for two questions from the Bronx. Good morning. My question has to do, um, it's regarding human rights and multinational corporations. In 2003, the UN approved a set of ethics guidelines for multinational corporations, with particular guidelines for companies operating in conflict zones. With the increased operations of multinational corporations, how effective are these guidelines, and what is the UN currently doing to ensure that they are complied with? Question. Second question, please. Uh, good morning. I have uh, two questions, but they're related somehow. 
Uh, my first question is about 